We will have people at the close of the service at the green covered tablecloth there would be glad to uh, get you a card where we can get some information about you so that we can continue to stay in touch with you. There are a lot of things we do each Sunday. There are a lot of things we do during the year. We'd love to have you be a part of it. We've got a big event around Memorial Day weekend. We've got a number of things going on during the summer. So thank you so much for being here today. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 24 today. We're going to begin in verse 13 in just a moment. Luke chapter 24. And we're going to begin in just a moment. Verse 13. You know, in his book, Soul Set Free, Pastor John Lindell shared an account from his life when he was part of a group that was touring the Grand Canyon. This wasn't a, a casual tour, uh, a bus tour. It, there were no stops at the Hyatt or even the Holiday Inn. It was actually a backpack expedition. And at the beginning of this tour, the guide for the tour who would be with them for a number of days told them basically this, expect the unforeseen. And then he began to list the potential dangers that awaited them during the trip. He said, don't hit the ants because if you hit them, they will most certainly bite you. Uh, the first night as they began to jockey for a position of who would get the tent and who would be left out, the tour guide said wisely, he said, you don't want the tent. It's going to be hot all week and it'll be 15 degrees hotter inside of the tent. He said, and, and by the way, when you prepare to go down at night, he had a five-gallon bucket and used, euphemistically he said, do your business there. Don't go to the restrooms because there will be pink rattlesnakes in the restroom area at night. I looked it up. There actually are pink rattlesnakes that their habitat, their sole habitat in the world is actually at the Grand Canyon. And as if things couldn't become even more worse, he, he said that uh, when you awaken in the morning, uh, be careful when you get out of your bedroll and don't shake it too hard. There may be scorpions in there and they might sting you. And he said, and by the way, if you feel them at night, lie as motionless as you can. That would be very hard for me. He said, but then the problem also, there are wolf spiders that may potentially harm you during uh, this excursion. He said, and, and if they bite you, we have a lot of problems. We'll actually have to helicopter you to a hospital. Needless to say, that wouldn't be the first trip I volunteered to be a part of. <laughs> in fact, Lindell notes in his book, he says, suffice it to say, every trip has unexpected surprises. Isn't that true? In our trip through life, we have unexpected surprises. Uh, today we're looking in Luke chapter 24, and these two disciples we're going to see who are on the road to Emmaus, they had an unexpected surprise of the pleasant variety. Look with me, beginning in verse 13. Now that same day, that is the day of the resurrection, two of them verse 13, were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked them. So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the chief priests, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things 
happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb. When they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found the tomb just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Jesus said to them, how foolish and slow you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going and, gave the, and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word these few moments, God, you're a good God. Forgive us for the times that we develop a caricature or a false representation of who you are. You're a God of grace. You're a God of mercy. You're a patient God. But more than anything today, we celebrate that you're a powerful God who can make an eternal difference in our lives. Father, speak to us through your word this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the context of uh, this setting uh, was this. These two disciples were traveling probably late afternoon into the early evening on Resurrection Sunday. They were traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It was about a seven mile journey. And as they were traveling, the scripture tells us that the two men were dejected. They were despondent. They were discouraged because of all of the events that happened. The scripture says that they were walking and they were talking. In fact, even and they were arguing. I thought it was amusing. Jesus came to them in the middle of an argument. And, and so many times we try to hide so many things, we can't hide anything from Jesus. And so Jesus joins them unexpectedly on this road. And they begin to express the source of their de dejection as it's recorded in verse 21, in speaking of Jesus, and they didn't know that they were talking with Jesus at that moment. They thought he was just some man. They said, but we were hoping that he, Jesus, would be the one who was to redeem Israel. They had preconceived expectations of their journey, of their trip, of their excursion, how it would all unfold. We understand that many people in that day believed that, that the Messiah would come. He would be a great king. He would be a visible king. He would be a great military leader. He would quell uh, the Roman Empire and their army, and he would establish his rule. The problem was God's plan wasn't the same as their plans. And so we find that they were dejected. They were discouraged. And so as Jesus joins them, we see that he was going to provide for them. He was going to provide for them new life. They didn't realize it when they began that journey. I, I want to look this morning at, at this account and the title for this morning's message is this, what does it take? What does it take for our eyes to be open? What does it take spiritually for us to be able to see what God is doing in and around us? In these few verses today, we see that two men were transformed as their spiritual sight became real, as they saw Jesus for who he is. But what does it take for you and for me to trust God? 
You know, many of us, we have trust issues, don't we? I can confess I have trust issues in my life. And many times we have trouble trusting people, don't we? There's an anonymous quote that goes like this. There are two reasons we do not trust people. First, we do not know them. And second, we do know them. Someone wisely said, do not trust everything you see because even salt looks like sugar. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of us, we struggle trusting people. Maybe by nature, we're just not a trusting person. We have issues. We depend on ourselves. We struggle trusting what others say or what others do. We may question motives. It may be today that we struggle with trusting others because they have let us down, because they've not met our expectations. And as a result of that, in this issue of, of trust, we struggle getting back on the horse, fearing that we'll be let down again. But on the authority of God's word on this Resurrection Sunday, God will not let us down. And God is able to do and provide what you and I need in our lives. In regard to these two disciples this morning, there were clearly three operatives enacted that were seeking to increase their faith. And these things were not of them, they were of God. In fact, we would say they would be apart from them. And I want to look at these three today. And through these three operatives, while it didn't start so great for them in their eyes of understanding, by the end of this account, we see that they truly realized who Jesus was just in time because after that, Jesus was removed from their presence. But I want you to see first this morning of the three, these two men received the operative of a witness of those who did believe. In other words, they heard the witness of others. You know, world, or word rather, travels fast in this world, doesn't it? In fact, something could happen right now, and by the time we're at home, it could have happened across the world, and we would know about it very quickly through the 24-hour news cycle. I'm old enough to still remember that you got all of your news between 6 and 7 o'clock on weeknights. But today, uh, there's news everywhere. Uh, there's news on social media. And if you miss something, it must be that you're out of touch. But it's amazing as we look back to this account in biblical times without the World Wide Web, without all of the information technology, that word traveled very quickly that day. By Resurrection Sunday afternoon, what had happened early that morning had already reached the ears of these two disciples, even as they were making their ways to Emmaus. And what they heard should have led them to believe the report. Yet they were still struggling. They were still struggling whether to believe. Notice what it says in verse 22. It says in their report, some women from our group astounded us. These women had gone to the tomb and they had an unexpected journey of their own. They thought they were going to come and prepare a proper burial uh, for Jesus with the spices and all of that and take care of him in that manner. Yet they found that his body was missing. And more than that, they were themselves astounded to find out that two men had reported that Jesus was alive. So within a, an amount of about nine or ten hours, these women had experienced that at dawn on that Resurrection Sunday. And this afternoon, those two disciples knew about it. This statement is true, though, as we think about the report these two men received. Some people stand more ready to believe than others. That's just the truth. We're not clones. We don't act in accordingly with the information that we receive. Some people are more ready to believe than others. 
I think, to an account that followed this a number of years. King Agrippa, who was the nephew of the uh, Herod that we looked at last week who uh, had encountered Jesus. But, but this Agrippa was a man, the scripture says, was educated. In fact, Paul said that he knew the Jewish ways very well. So he was not the dullest tool. In fact, he was pretty sharp. He was a prominent man. He was a man of a great family. And so he came to witness Paul. He was drawn in and Paul began to share his testimony with Agrippa. And, and at first it seemed that really Agrippa was challenging and questioning Paul, but through the conversation it turned and Paul began to question Agrippa. Basically his message was this, do you believe? And then there was the famous response of Agrippa after hearing Paul's testimony about meeting the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He said, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. You see the restraint there, almost, but you didn't. Another translation in our English language today would say, do you think, Paul, you can convince me so easily or so quickly to become a Christian. On that scale of people who would be ready to believe or not, really Agrippa was at the bottom of that scale. He was not ready to believe. The two men in our account today who heard the women's report, they were like Agrippa initially. Notice it says in verse 24, some of those who were with us, that was the disciples, they went to the tomb and they found it just as the women said. But they did not see him. In other words, here we see the men had heard a second witness, not only for those, from those who first saw Jesus early that morning, the women, but the disciples went and they said, yes, we did not find his body. Yet notice the doubt. Said, but they didn't see him. They didn't see him. What will it take? For you to believe. Here were two witnesses, yet they were not ready to believe. But I want you to see a, a second truth. Not only did they possess the witness of the women who came back from the empty tomb, who had received the report from the angels, not only did they receive the witness of the disciples, but these two men possessed the witness of the Old Testament scriptures. The scriptures were operating even while they didn't know it. God's Word is true. When we open God's Word, we begin to read it, but it begins to read us at the same time. And so while they were not at this point ready to believe, God's Word was chiseling at these two individuals' hearts. In these verses, they still did not, in the middle of this account, realize it was Jesus with whom they were talking they saw him, but they didn't recognize him. This past week, I was in Lynchburg, and I was uh, in the Christian bookstore there, and, and I saw this lady, but I, I just looked and, and, and didn't connect. And then, secondly, I, I began to see she worked with special needs adults, and I began to make the connection. And I say, oh, I know her, and we began to talk. And, and I thought, why didn't I recognize her? I'd not seen her since before COVID. I knew her well. But I wasn't expecting to see her in Lynchburg. How many times maybe we're somewhere outside of our, our regular uh, domain and we see somebody and we think, well, it can't be that person. What would they be doing here? That's the way it was with these two disciples. They were disciples. They had followed Jesus. They obviously had seen him. They knew about him. But they were not making the connection. And so they're talking to him just as if he's another traveler. But notice what Jesus said after hearing not only that the women had reported, but also the other disciples had reported back about the resurrection. He said, how foolish you are and slow to believe. 
foolish and slow to believe. He didn't say, oh, well, that's okay. You didn't have enough information there. They, they saw the body was missing, but they didn't see Jesus walking. No, he said, you're slow to believe and you're foolish. They didn't believe what? They didn't believe the original report of the women who came from the tomb. Also, they didn't believe uh, the, the report of the disciples who themselves went and found the tomb empty. But more than that, and this is important for you and for me, they did not believe what the scriptures said about Jesus, about his Messiahship, about his person, about his resurrection, as presented in the Old Testament teachings. You see, the Old Testament attests to the fact that Jesus lived, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus would die, and that he would be raised from the dead. Anywhere between 1,400 years before Jesus was born and 400 years before Jesus was born, Moses, the prophets, the Old Testament writers attested to the veracity of exactly what happened in the life of these two disciples. Jesus speaks of the testimony of Moses and the prophets. And through the Old Testament, we see numerous foreshadowings of Jesus Christ. He is pictured as the ram caught in the thicket when Abraham was prepared to offer Isaac. He was the substitute. He was pictured as the Passover lamb <coughs> that was offered, the blood placed upon the door to provide salvation and protection for those who would believe. He was the subject, a picture of the offerings that were offered under the Levitical system of the Old Testament. Then we see Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks, 69 weeks having been fulfilled and then the Messiah being cut off, that is, crucified. Isaiah pictures him as the suffering servant years before, 700 years before Jesus came to this earth. And then there were the prophecies of Jesus' resurrection. A little bit of a prompter at this point to encourage you to come out to the revival services in Dillwyn on Tuesday night. I'm going to be preaching out of Job chapter 19. It was a, a chapter that was drawn to my attention when my father-in-law passed away a few weeks ago. I was discouraged. I happened to read in my devotional and it pointed me to this. And, and Job 19.25 says, I know that my Redeemer lives and at the end he will stand on the dust. That's Job. I know my Redeemer lives. Psalm 1610, speaking beforehand of Jesus, says, For God, you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies of the Messiahship of Jesus, of the suffering and the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These testaments alone should be enough. So we see the verbal testimony of those who witnessed. We see the testimony of Scripture. That should be enough for them to believe. Imagine for a moment that we were to leave this place today or you were to leave and you saw a family member that said, boy, this event happened over in Ukraine today. And you'd say, well, maybe they heard it right. Then you get home, you're on the phone, you're talking with someone who doesn't know that family member who lives maybe even in another state and they say, boy, wasn't that amazing what happened in Ukraine. On those two testimonies alone that were distinct, that would lead us to believe something happened. Yet we see these disciples were still struggling. And here's the beautiful part of the Word of God here. He gave these individuals the witness of the women. He gave them the witness of Scripture. But we see another operative, the drawing of the grace of God. Aren't you glad that God's not like we are? Jesus was said, you foolish and slow to believe. If he were like you and me, he would probably say, I'm done, I'm going to walk away. But he didn't because he loved them. He loves you and me. And he knows that we're of clay. He knows left to ourselves that we'll go our own way and that we struggle. There are two verses in this morning's text that jump out at me and we're almost finished this morning. 
Verse 16, but they were prevented from recognizing him. They were prevented. And then a, a later verse, verse 31, after they sat with Jesus at the table and dined, it said their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he had disappeared from their sight. Twice we see the passive voice used, not the active voice. It didn't say they didn't understand him. It said they were prevented from understanding the passive voice. And then it didn't say they opened their eyes. No, their eyes were open. Listen to me on the authority of God's word. You'll never believe in the Lord Jesus Christ apart from the unction and work of God's spirit working in your heart. Now, there are things that you can do to harden your heart to it, but let's not be mistaken. It is the grace of God and the grace of God alone that saves a person, that brings to truth in our hearts what is true of all, and that is Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Interestingly, both of these verses speak of these disciples in the passive voice. So I imagine after that happened, when they went and shared testimony, if we heard more, they wouldn't say, and boy, and I did this, and I did that, and I did that. No, they were saying, he did that. He did that. He did that. Their ability to see who Jesus was was totally a result of God's grace to them. God's grace. A number of years ago, I was talking with a longtime friend, and we had played ball together for a number of years. Even at that time, I'd known him a number of years. When I asked him about his standing with God, he said, well, Rick, I've got it in my back pocket. I'm going to take care of it. I've got it, and before I die, I'm going to get right with God. There are two problems with that thought. One is we don't know how long we're going to live. We had a pastor in our area in Amelia a week ago Wednesday was driving or riding on his motorcycle to go to lead a Bible study in Jetersville. Somebody swerved across the way, hit him, and he died. It's the, 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 the church was waiting for him to come and lead the Bible study and word began to come in that there was an accident. They thought maybe he was deterred from coming to Farmville to Amelia. They found out though that he lost his life. We don't know how long we have. I'm thankful that he knew the Lord. But secondly, it's not on our terms. We're not God of this world. He is. We humbly come to him. God, be gracious to me. God, speak to me. God, reveal to me who you are. They saw Jesus as the resurrected Messiah. You know, shortly after this account, Jesus was talking with another disciple. This was one of the original 12, the close disciple, Thomas. You may remember what happened in Thomas's life. It's where we get the term doubting Thomas from. But the first night that Jesus appeared to the disciples, all of them were there, 10, because Judas was already uh, turned over to, to, to follow the devil, which was his, his Lord. But among the 11, all 10 were there except Thomas. And can you imagine what a Sunday to miss? Because Jesus appeared, the disciples were saying everything that was happening, and Thomas said, I don't believe it. Now this was a man that walked with Jesus for three years, I don't believe it. He said, I will not believe unless I see his hands, unless I touch his hands and his prints, unless I touch his hip. Next week, Thomas was there and Jesus came. Jesus said, here I am. Jesus met him at his point. Said, stop being unbelieving and believe. He realized that Thomas didn't even have to put his hand on his body. He said, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said something that's so important to us. Because you have seen me, Thomas, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. People say seeing is believing. No, the grace of God working in us is what leads us to believe. I wonder if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
Have you allowed him to speak truth into your heart? Are you yielding yourself to his grace working in and through your life? Just a moment. Tony is going to come and sing. It's a beautiful song. It's going to be our invitation. I've thought, should we stand up? Should we sit down? I'll be honest. I feel like it's better for you to sit. Usually we stand during an invitation. But I pray that as he sings this song, that the message of this song will stir your heart, soften your heart, that, that God's grace would be work in and through that. You would be, be able to take the spiritual blinders off and be able to see what Jesus has done for you in the hope that he and he alone gives. You may want to pray where you are. I'll be at the front for anybody who would like to publicly say, I want to know the Lord Jesus. I want to know him better. However God leads, you be in prayer. You may want your eyes open as Tony comes to sing or close, but Tony, if you'll come.